Thank you. Right, so uh, I tend to generally use Rust for sort of command line utilities or things where I sort of want it to be available but don't want all of the overhead of managing Ruby or something else along those lines. Um, and sort of like I've had a history of that over time, you know, connected to a little bit of hardware to talk to a USB device, that kind of thing. But in this particular scenario, I've um, come up with a way that I want to use it to make my life easier when I'm managing servers. And so when you're, uh, well, first of all, before we get into it, um, a lot of the code that I've got written in here won't compile as is. Uh, so don't go typing into your computer and then getting annoyed if it doesn't work. Uh, but if you are after real code, I've got it up on the repository associated with this crate. Um, so a lot of the things I'll talk about that aren't fictional will actually be in there in some form or another. Anyway, so back to what I was saying about servers. Um, I have this kind of history where I'll fire up a VPS somewhere, it costs me five bucks a month, I'll kind of forget about it, and 12 months later I'm like, why do I have that running? I want to get back into it and work out uh, what's going on, but if I've changed my uh, SSH keys I've used in the meantime, I generally don't have a way to get back in, so I kind of delete it and hope that nothing breaks. Um, now, I generally will keep my keys up to date on GitHub, on the other hand, who publicly make those keys available under a URL per user. And so I was thinking it'd be really cool if I could just pull them from there whenever I want to log into a remote service. But I also want to make sure I don't get locked out. I want to make sure it's fairly safe. And so the, what I'm looking for on a utility as a result is I want something that will pull authorized keys from GitHub as an example, but generally any HTTP source. Uh, <laughs> um, no, 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 no SSL supported. Um, it will then validate them uh, and will be able to change the options. You know, like if I don't trust a particular source as much, I can say restrict the commands it can run or restrict what it's able to do. And also then I want to make sure these keys are caged in case, uh, you know, we have another one of those GitHub red days where it's down for 24 hours and then suddenly I can't log into all my servers. So Rust is a really good fit for this kind of problem in my mind because it allows me to produce a single uh, redistrib uh, single distributable binary that I can just drop onto a Linux server and uh, with minimal configuration it's just going to work and in the bargain I don't have to sort of uh, work with like a 20 or 30 year old language that has a lot of paper cuts we've learned about in the meantime and finally because the language is nice to use there are a lot of people who put a lot of work into building libraries that uh, make things easier from that point as well so I don't have to worry about the semantics of actually going and making HTTP requests or any of the other things that I might have to in other cases. So first thing you need to look at before we can do a lot of the safety uh, checks that I was talking about in the application is to understand the format we're talking about. And so SSH, you create a file for your user account generally that has a list of all of the keys that are allowed to log in as you. And that can come, uh, that, each line of that file has anywhere from two to four fields. So it can start with options or they can be absent. Then it identifies the type of the key. So what kind of cryptography format you're using with it. Uh, the encoded key gives you the data associated with it. Uh, so like the, um, the bytes of the said public key. And then finally, you can put comments at the end to keep it human identifiable. So you know, oh, okay, this came from my laptop or my work machine and just to keep track of that there. And so you can see a few examples here of valid uh, keys under that set of structure. And you might notice towards the end there, some of them start to get interesting options where they've got multiple options separated by commas or escaped back quote, um, so, uh, double quotes, a few different things like that that can get a little bit harder to parse under CD or more uh, naive approaches like using regex or similar. So what I was after was to build a kind of a model like this that was fairly easy to manipulate. So I can say, okay, the options are either, like they always have a name, they may have a value. Uh, then the actual public key itself, it has a type, it has encoded string data. And then finally, that sort of all fits together in a format that also has comments available. And so the bottom struct represents a single line and then the, uh, the ones above it represent single parts of that that I may want to modify. So if you to take a look at an example line, we, uh, we've got restrict, command uptime, those are our options. So we have one that's just restrict, no value. The other one is uh, command and then a value of uptime. So that says that this key, when it is used to connect to the server, it will run the uptime commands. It'll tell you how long the server's been running for and that's all it can do. Followed up by that, then there's the um, actual key type itself and the encoded key uh, so that OpenSSH can recognize or challenge you to verify you are who you say you are. 
And then finally, whatever's left over at the end of the line is uh, considered your comments. And so uh, I wanted to stick to sort of fairly simple and idiomatic Rust approaches to actually turning it from the mapping and the string vice versa. So in essence, I wanted something that would look like this. I read in the file, uh, I run from str on it, and then once, if that goes through successfully, then I can pull out the authorizations from it because there may be comments as well in the file and just to sort of get the list of what's actually allowed to log in and work with that. And so uh, we have parsers. Uh, is, they're kind of a section of um, computer science that sort of talk about the process by which we break down a stream of data using strict rules. And they're really important in compilers as one example, but they sort of, they get used in a lot of different areas like uh, media encoding or um, uh, network streaming. There's a whole heap of sort of things where you have to make, uh, get meaning back out of a set stream. And uh, Rust, for example, its compiler will take a file and it will break it down into different components and then reassemble them in a sense that it allows it to make decisions about what the code needs to do. So it, you know, if you've got two numbers and a, a plus sign in between them, making sense of what each of those things represents and what you're building as a result. So the parser focuses on taking that stream of data and breaking it into recognizable pieces. And so there are lots of different ways to build parsers. As, um, um, there are probably entire books or series of books on just the different ways you can do it. We talk about recursive descent parsing or um, like what uh, other types of bottom-up parsing, there's a whole variety of them. And this is kind of reflected a bit as well. Like if you look on crates, almost a thousand different crates that handle, uh, at least uh, match the word parsing on a search. Some of them are specific to, oh sorry, parser. And some of them are specific to certain data formats, but there are definitely a few libraries that talk about building them for your own purposes as well. And the first one of these that I tried for uh, actually building something was one called Pest. And now PEST is a parser generator. So the idea is you describe what you're um, processing as a grammar, which says that these, uh, this is how all of the, these are how all of the pieces fit together next to one another. And so uh, you end up with what are referred to as parser expression grammars, which are a way of defining it. And for PEST, they look a lot like regular expressions, but they are a lot more composable as well. So I can say, this is what a string looks like, and then refer to a string somewhere else rather than trying to jam regexes and regexes. And this is actually really useful for parsing recursive components in particular. So for example, if we take a look at a line of Rust code, you can uh, say that, oh, a statement is gonna be made of these components, keyword, identifier, type, value, and then you can take that later and then you can break it down and look at its inner parts and match across them and go, okay, this is a keyword, I need to do this in this case. And by using that pattern matching, you can decide what to do at each level as you go down. Uh, and implementing a, a pest parser is really easy because you have a struct, you put those two attributes on the top, you say, this is a drive the default implementation of a parser, here's the grammar, go do your thing. Uh, and that will, that will um, compile out into you know, 800,000 lines of code easily in, um, as I add compile time when the macros actually expand that grammar out into usable, uh, so like parsable instances. And so for my particular use cases, my grammar looked a little bit like this. So you get a key authorization, which is either a key type encoded key followed by comments, optionally, or it's options key type encoded type, uh, key comments. Now it's, uh, there's an important distinction here, which is to do with the way that the parser that PEST generates works because it is an eager, it's a really eager to match and it's greedy. So the idea is the first thing it can match, it just goes straight down that chain as much as possible. So I had originally written it the other way around, options, key type, encoded key comments, or even I just put a question mark on the options. But it turns out that any valid key type actually looks like an option. And so it would always go, oh, I found some options. Okay, where's the key type? And then it would get to something that's completely not a key type. And then it would just go, no, I can't match this. And so any time I didn't have options, it wouldn't work. So uh, it, you end up in this interesting scenario where you have to carefully consider the precedence of rules you put together as a result. But that actually does have benefits compared to other parser types because the, because the parser will not go back and try other options. It means it's not gonna surprise you by uh, doing something you didn't predict as a result. 
And then we go further down. So um, like if we look at the bottom line, skipping there, uh, Pest understands the concept of white space as something you might want to just accept. And so in the top line, that is implicitly accepted between each of those identifiers. But going down to options, option, etc., I, uh, according to the actual source format, I can't allow white space. And so I'm able to indicate using the dollar sign, I will still want to know about parts of this, but no white space allowed in the here. Um, like the format has to be exactly how I say it is. And then I'm able to say a list of options is one option followed by zero or more comma option. Um, and then an option itself is either an identifier equals a string or it's just an identifier. And then I'm able to sort of go down further until I get to the bottom, uh, like the string car, which is saying, okay, if you come across something that is not a backslash or a double quote, take it. If you come across a backslash followed by a backslash or a double quote, take both of those as well. And that way there it's able to detect, hang on, I can't take anything further when it encounters a unescaped double quote and is able to say, okay, I've finished the string. Uh, and when you sort of start thinking about things like the matching, um, yeah, matching backslashes or uh, escaping control characters, that kind of thing, regex is not the greatest place to try and do that because you have to try and build in logic, a kind of stateful logic to it. And this bypasses that quite handily as a result, which made my life a lot easier. It did come with a little bit of a... Uh, interesting side effect though, which is like when you took a look at the code I generated, I split it across functions, which kind of helped a lot, but uh, for readability purposes, but it still was really nested. It's deep, matching a lot, iterating a lot. And so you just kind of get, um, it's like you have to go so deep to actually start extracting some of that information, push it back out into mutable state because you're trying to get one of one type and one of another, you don't know the order of in an iterator. And sort of you're stepping back out until you get to the end of it. But at the end of the day, it worked and I wrote tests, the test pass, and I was able to say, okay, this is version 0.9. Uh, maybe I wasn't quite that excited, but you know, it's still a good day. But I wasn't necessarily that pleased, I guess, about how maintainable or understandable what I had was because there was a lot of times where I'm like, okay, I'm matching across like two or three of these rules. I'm saying to the compiler, to the rest, no, nah, that can't ever be matched. And there are a lot of, I guess, more pitfalls than I would expect in a Rust program as a result. I wasn't that confident that in six months I'd come back to it if I had to modify it and have a good idea of what was going on. And so next, I produced what I like to refer to as a manual nested finite state automata, or I mean, it works. Um, this is not a thing, this is not a concept, but I did use the, I guess, the principles of a finite state automata parser underneath, and then I just kind of put layers in place until it worked. Um, and so this started off by me looking, okay, why isn't the PEST solution working for me? Because it's clear that the problem is not with the library. There are a lot of great successful uses with it. So where, where have I gone wrong with my fit? And I just took a step back and go, okay, what's the format I'm looking at? And really, if I treat the comments as always going to at least be an empty string, I need to worry about two cases. There's a shorter form, which is it's a key type. It's the key, it's comments. Or well, the longer form are in the form of there are options key type encoded key comments. And I had produced this wonderful thing that was doing all sorts of nesting and uh, deep matching and iterating and all of these things to handle one of those two cases. And so I thought about it and went, okay, so what I need to focus on is I take characters till I hit an unescaped control character. And then I would go, if it makes sense as that part, then I interpret it as that thing. And then I repeat that until I pass the whole thing. Uh, with appropriate error handling in the case of it just not making any sense. And so the what I refer to as the finite state automata is basically this here. It's just a small thing for keeping track of, am I currently within double quotes? It's like, is this a string where space is all commas are fine? Uh, was the last character a slash for keeping track of whether I need to escape something? And finally, what is the control character I'm looking for? And the idea there is that I have implementations against this, so I just feed in character by character and it knows what was my last state. Okay, is the next character still part of this? And I can continue going on until I know there's something I have to pull apart. And so uh, some very fictional code here about how this would break it down as a result. So you got uh, the options at the start. So there's restrict, command uptime, uh, SSH, RSA, the base64 encoded string, and then the comments. And so the approach is you take that keyline parser I was referring to, have it break on spaces, and then you just take the first thing. 
and it will take all the way to the end of the double quotes at the end of uptime, because that's the first unescaped space it encounters. And then it goes, okay, I'm gonna match that. I'm gonna try and parse it into a key type. If that succeeds, then I know it's just key type, or, um, the actual key and then the options, uh, sorry, the comments. If that doesn't succeed, then a one I've encountered is probably an option string, so backtrack, try that, then move on to you know, parsing the rest of the sequence. And really in that case, there's only two options about the way it can go, and then each of those is just about parsing the individual fields and making sure they work. And so with the nesting that I was referring to, it kind of looks like this. I've got the logic for parsing a single option, then looking at the list of options because that has its own sort of control character set. And then above that, it's about parsing the full line itself, maybe in the context of a file. And it was about 213 formatted lines of code once I'd finished writing all of that. And it felt like a fairly big win compared to the PES code because it wasn't necessarily much shorter, despite the fact that I'd gone and built all of that grammar. I could kind of actually step through each st uh, state of the logic and go, hang on, why, why am I encountering weirdness here? I can actually see every line as a result. Uh, and once again, the test pass. I could, can carry on, and so version 0 0.10 was born. And I kind of got to this point, though, and I went, okay, I'm not exactly the world's uh, most proficient crustacean, and I am saying that I can do a better job than someone who's probably been working at Parsers for years, who's gone and built a great library for it. Have I actually shot myself in the foot when it comes to performance? So this is an excellent excuse to learn a little bit more about benchmarking as well. And so I gave it a bit of a shot across the different cases and I found that like my preferred test case is to parse a 1000 line authorized keys file. And I managed to drop that from 10 se uh, milliseconds with PEST to six milliseconds with the code that I've written as well. So it's about a 41% improvement. Uh, and this actually surprised me quite a bit because I was doing a lot of mistakes, like a lot of allocations of characters and defectors and making decisions. And so I guess it gave me a little bit of an indication I've definitely been using PEST the wrong way whether that was because it was the wrong purpose or whether I just didn't really know how to use it properly. I got there in the long run, but it turns out even in sort of a very naive hand roll, my first attempt at this solution was able to improve on that. And so at the end of that, I was kind of looking at it and I was going, okay, now how would I feel about maintaining this in six months? And the answer still wasn't all that great <laughs> because I have a history of sort of like whenever I try to get too clever with things, it generally, I, uh, you know, the lean of six months time is not quite so happy about those decisions. And so I'd actually tried NOM to start with. It's another parsing library that's sort of fairly popular in Rust. In, um, in fact, you often hear people talking about um, NOM and about PEST in the same kind of conversations. And I'd originally tried it, but I didn't get very far with it because it was kind of looking, it's oriented for things that weren't quite what I was trying to do. And it's a, it still is actually a good fit, but at first, because well, I hadn't wrapped my head around it, I found PEST easier to yeah, sort of work with, and I was like, okay, well, let's just do that. But anyway, I came back to norm, and I went, okay, now I have a good understanding of the domain, like what, how each of these things breaks down and where the pitfalls are. Maybe I can give it another shot. And so to talk about norm, it's referred to as a parser combinators library. So the idea is you build things as the smallest possible discrete units of things that you want to match in the language. So if you're writing a HTTP parser, you want to match first on HTTP to make sure the request coming in is actually intended to be that and not something completely different. And then you'd look, okay, what's the version? What's the path? You kind of break things down into the smallest meaningful pieces. And then you sort of combine those together to make more and more meaning at higher levels. Uh, and here is an example of how I was able to use it to parse an escapable string. So this is about 10 lines, including the two lines of comments. And I'm able to say, okay, I want to create a named parser. I want it to be parse an escapable string. It takes a string slice, it returns a string slice. And it is delimited by double quotes. And in the middle it accepts, uh, it allows escaping. So it says, I will happily take anything that uh, is not a double a double quote or a backslash. And you can escape characters using a backslash and that's allowed to escape double quotes and backslashes. So as a way for me to say, anything goes except these characters, but they can be escaped in this fashion. And so those 10 lines there handle the sort of like cases that I was building whole finite state automata to handle. 
Uh, and the outcome of those 10 lines is a function with this kind of definition. So it says, okay, parse escapable string takes a string slice, and then it either returns a parse error, which can be sort of improved for um, being able to point out where things went wrong, or uh, the error types as well also handle a distinction between I ran into trouble and I'm expecting more data, which is really good if you're trying to build a streaming uh, setup. But the actual OK return type is two string slices because it says, here's what I didn't actually need to use, and here was my outcome. So later on, when I'm actually using this to parse structs instead, it returns, uh, like the first type returns a string slice and then a struct. So the remainder, the remainder of the data that's usable by the next thing in sequence. And this only really started to make a lot more sense when I was careful to break down the elements of the language and layer them on top of one another. So I start with what is the most fundamental part of what I'm, parts of what I'm dealing with, like what type of identifier is it, uh, what type of matching I need to do across that, and then start to compose that into parts that go up. So an option really is just an identifier, but an option with a value is actually an identifier welded together with a string by an equal sign. And then reaching the next layer where I'm going, okay, I have enough data now to turn this into a struct that I can work with. And then at the top level, the full, I'm able to say, okay, here's a line, break it down into each of its pieces. And it's not even possibly valid Rust, I'm sure. But anyway, it uh, sort of gives you an idea of what happens down that chain. So I start at the top and I'm parsing a key authorization, but that actually is looking for, is it an option or an optionless one? And that's breaking down at the next level. And it kind of goes all the way down until it can finally match on something. And then that sort of, uh, all of those pieces become available over the course of the, uh, the sequence of the string. And then at the end, you've got enough to sort of reduce it together into your final state. And that actually turned out to be 113 lines of formatted code. So that was about half, uh, maybe a little bit more than half of what it was when I hand wrote it. But um, at the same time, it was, like a lot of the sort of normal pitfalls were kind of covered by macros or parts of the library for me already. And so a lot of it was able, it was just me going, this is the specific domain I'm dealing with in this case. And the test pass, and I still want to add a few more tests, so I haven't released it yet, but I uh, sort of plan to get that next version out there soon. And possibly I may go for the stable version instead if I get enough confidence across it. Now, reaching the end of this, this is obviously a time to come back and take a look at performance again. And I actually managed to get an even better increase over my previously written code by using this. So that thousand line uh, authorized keys file is now being processed in three milliseconds. And I'm pretty sure I can't get a web server written in Ruby to respond in under three uh, milliseconds if it's just returning a static string. Um, and like to me, I'm really happy with that. But at the same time, it's not really the most important thing in this because in order of importance, the three wins that I really came across as I went across this is, or went to NOM was, I'm now using a library that actually a lot more people know about rather than having handwritten some of my own stuff that probably contains bugs. So for me to come back to it later, there's gonna be more documentation, or if someone else wants to come along and contribute to it, there's more documentation. Um, then the second thing I like is that there is le uh, there's less code. And that co it isn't sort of like I've jammed more uh, logic into lines. It's more a case of there's less, uh, I guess, less conditions to think about, less that you have to kind of step through in your head and try and predict the outcomes of. And so it means that uh, you can have more confidence and predictability in what's going to actually come out as a result, provided that the library you're using is written well. Uh, and I'm fairly confident in this case it is. Then the last thing I really like about it is the fact that it has significantly improved the speed. And I mean, at the end of the day, when I'm talking about SSH connections, I'm talking about uh, my service connect, uh, my machine's connecting to another machine over the internet. It's negotiating TCP protocol, negotiating key exchange, all of these things. I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna notice the difference between three and uh, six milliseconds in terms of how long it takes to validate the keys for a thousand line file, but it still is really nice to know that it's not wasting time. And it would actually be a little more relevant if I'm talking about running in more constrained uh, situations like what I want to put on a Raspberry Pi. But I think there are two main outcomes that I really learned from this, aside from what I've learned about parsing as a sort of general domain. The two times that I saw the most improvement in what I produced, the first time was when I considered myself maintaining it six months' time. Am I going to come back to this before I've had my coffee on a bad morning, having to fix a bug at a critical time? Am I going to be happy or annoyed with my, the past version of myself? 
all the decisions I've made. And the second thing is, I get a lot more confidence and I'm a lot more, I find a lot more predictable if I start by building the small pieces, being confident they work and building up as, on top of that. And the first time I tried NOM, part of the reason I didn't succeed with it was because I tried to get straight to the answer. I was like, I wanted to be passing the thing. And because I'm comp uh, combining pieces of logic that I don't necessarily see at the time, I haven't predicted things and then it's uh, like little ambiguities in what I've written that, uh, because I'm just trying to rush ahead. Whereas on the other hand, when I took it the opposite direction, I went, okay, start at the bottom and build up. I was able to go recognize a string, write tests for that, be sure it works, and then marry it into the next piece and continue that up the chain until I've built on a solid foundation that I can turn back to and go, I found a bug in the string parsing logic and know that the whole chain will respond in a way I can, or at least that there'll be tests or the other framework in place that allows me to go, I've made the right fix here as opposed to I've broken it somewhere else. And I mean, aside from that, uh, it was a good opportunity, I guess, to play with Rust in the sense of learning things that are way outside what I would normally do. And even though I may not use Rust in my day job, I've learned things in the process that I can take back to all of the software design I do as a result. And that's about it from me. So I'm happy to take any questions if people have them. Oh, I'm actually, uh, so with what I'm building, it doesn't actually directly interface with SSH. The open SSH server has a property you can set in the configuration that says, you um, call this command in order to get a list of allowed keys for this user. And so in the process, I instead of building a bit of a thing where it will then go through the cache or through straight to GitHub to get those keys and then output them just to stand it out and then open SSH reads those. So I don't actually have to interface directly with the SSH protocol or any of the binaries. I just need to provide a standard out output after being called by the CLI. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, well, the, 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 I mean, so the, that hook capability exists and that's why I wanted to take advantage of that. The two reasons I didn't want to overwrite the authorized keys on sort of like a schedule was because A, that means I have to wait for it if there's been a recent change. Like if it's every day, then I have to wait another day. And the second thing is uh, you can still have your authorized keys file with this approach. And so I could have that as like a set of emergency keys behind it as well. Uh, but yeah, the, the capability is there and I thought it was a good, if nothing else, it was a good over-engineering for uh, a particular problem I'd run into. It's so IDE support, no. So I wouldn't recommend this if you're still kind of finding your feet a lot around the Rust syntax, because there's a little bit of an interesting uh, sort of tension between when you use non-macro versus when you're actually using a function you've written. Uh, you mostly just kind of get a feel for it. So at least I was getting um, the, like the same warnings I get from the Rust compiler showing up in my code editor saying, uh, this doesn't make sense in this context, but it wasn't always the most clear. Um, so like there's still a few things that I, I think with Norm and its documentation, I could also use a little bit of love. Um, that, that I think that's why I found Pest easier to start with in the first there half. Is, but, yeah, I did use that and it worked, it worked uh, very nicely in that regard, but um, with regards to the norm, I guess that part of that was why it was great to be starting at the small parts and working with the test just so I could found my feet with it as well. And like there are some aspects of it that are kind of custom syntax, but uh, also a lot of the time it's, you can kind of reason about it falls down to a function that looks like this uh, and start parsing your own things in. Most of the issues I ran into were things like, I would say, take while this condition is true and then it would reach the end of the string and the condition would continue to be true and then it tries to take the next character and it says, but I'm missing data. And then that actually comes back out as an error. So having to watch for those cases where I'm aware of, okay, this could be the end. If that's the case, handle this instead. And so a few things you have to handle in that regard, but a lot of the time you're able to sort of kind of write more just 
the, the logic of what you're trying to build, uh, like in this sense, where it's like, it's a limited string, it's limited by these characteristics and matching on these things in the middle. But yeah, there are definitely a few times where I'm like, but what does it look like when it compiles? And I think that is documented sometimes, but a lot of it, I guess, you kind of have to trust the type annotations more than anything else. So it's a, a compliant At time of connection, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, it's just about harder than getting an open source package. You thought about what you're doing on the server side of it, because this would be awesome for really contemporary access to modern things. Like if it was a bunch of server side logic, you'd say, right, Freddy's on call today and he's got to do some escalation thing and put a lot of these box X and there's some workflow enterprise, whatever, that loads out the D and Freddy tries to log in and Freddy gets some really good work. Yeah, so um, SSH actually already has some things that I discovered while I was researching the authorized keys format, and that it actually supports uh, CA infrastructure. Yeah, it's not just that that's the infrastructure. Well, no, not even that. It's like uh, you can have, uh, you can define in the authorized keys, this is a uh, allowed certificate authority uh, thing, and then that will sign certificates and do things like that. So that's one route you can go down. I think that's what um, Netflix built their implementation on. It's called Bless, I think it is. Uh, so there are some things there, but apparently, like, you know, I think at Envato, we've investigated that personally and gone, yeah, there's some things where that doesn't fit for us. Uh, but yeah, what, what you're talking about on the server side. So like the idea is this binary sits on the server and then whenever uh, someone tries to connect, if they're in the keys file, then it will. So I'm talking about the server side. The web, the web API that this thing is calling right. to, to fetch the keys is part of uh, yeah, so like at the moment, I'm mostly assuming those are static files, right. but uh, the like all of what I've talked about today is in a, li a crate library. So you'd be able to actually take that struct, put values into it, spit them out of strings, whatever you're looking to do in that sense. So if you were to point this same utility at a more dynamic source, it will just take whatever it is. Um, and I mean, like there's different, different configuration stuff I'm still working out, like how long you wait before trying again, all those things on the utility side. but um, yeah, the idea is it will basically probably just start as me having keys on GitHub, but maybe I might want to have uh, some kind of key that I regularly logs in and checks up time or something like that, and that becomes easy for me to do as a result. Um, were there any other sort of parsing libraries you looked at that didn't require the train? Was that primary? Uh, not in this instance, actually. I kind of like once I've. Um, Oh, like I only did NOM fairly recently, so I didn't I definitely didn't have time to squeeze anything in before talking about it here tonight. Um, uh, I am definitely not. Uh, I definitely didn't finish the slides twenty minutes before. Um, but uh, the I haven't really looked at anything else. Uh, honestly, at the moment, I am actually quite happy with the way it's built in NOM. I don't think there's like I've already spent all of this time writing one part of the utility I actually want. I think it is time for me to kind of go. All right get it to the stage I'm certain with it and move on. And in that sense, with Norm, I've got a fairly good idea of what's going on. I think uh, maybe I can find a library that's slightly better, but I just don't think I'm really gonna get big gains trying to go any further with that. But if I'm trying to pass something more complex, I would definitely be doing more research about how I do it, what those characteristics are, because you know, if you're starting to look at things that involve nesting, like JSON or something like that, I think you find that people are, there's a much sort of, yeah, there's much less uh, clear distinction between how suitable NOM and PEST are because you can start getting into much more subjective conversations about, well, is it easier to maintain the grammar or the com uh, combinators? And you kind of go down these routes where you have to sort of sit back and go, well, what suits the people who are working on it? Um, but yeah, in this instance, I'm chomping across a string and trying to turn it into one of two forms. And it feels like anything further would just be a lot of yak shaving really. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 no. But if you're. So oh, if you're just passing those. If you need to pass something rather than just a pure. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I mean, to be honest, I didn't investigate whether Serde would work for this. It didn't, mostly didn't consider, uh, it, yeah, appear to me. But um, at the same time, there's a, like a little bit of a difference about, like, there's the optional options at the start is actually one of the most 
interesting things to deal with because there was actual ambiguity in terms of interpreting that that made it a bit more challenging. So um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's like what I've got here, it will happily turn it into the strengths and I've got display um, traits implemented to turn it back out of strengths back into strings. And I've got examples uh, in the GitHub repository where I go, here's a, an existing file, I wanna harden it by setting these options at the start and taking the comments out. And then, yeah, that's all there. It's all in the examples, so I know it compiles every time. And yeah, in that sense, I can move on with it. But yeah. What's your, what's your um, IDE you've been using? Uh, I've primarily been using Visual Studio Code. Visual um, Studio. Uh, code. Uh, cool. the, uh, yeah, the, the lighter version, the text editor more than full IDE. Um, yeah, it has, uh, I think it's, has pretty much the reference implementation of uh, the Rust language server integration with the IDE. Um, I have occasionally kind of poked around with using um, the Rust support in uh, like the IntelliJ IDEs. Yeah. It's all right, um, uh, but I find like there are just some cases that one handles better than the other, but at the end of the day, it's um, easier for me to just have Visual Studio code set up everywhere than it is to have my JetBrains products. And so I tend to fall more back to what's the heavier ID when I've got more specialized cases I'm trying to deal with. Yeah. 